In the beginning was the sky world. She fell like maple seed, pirouetting on an autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in the sky world, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear, or maybe hope, she clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurtling downward, she saw only dark water below. But in that emptiness, there were many eyes gazing up at the sudden shaft of light. They saw there a small object, a dust moat in the beam. As it grew closer, they could see that it was a woman, arms outstretched, long black hair billowing behind as she spiraled towards them. The geese nodded at one another and rose together from the water in a wave of goose crescendo. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath her to break her fall. Far from the only home she had ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer, so they called a council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather, loons, otters, swans, beavers, fish of all kinds. A great turtle floated in their midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. Gratefully, she stepped from the goose wings and onto the dome of the turtle's shell. The others understood she needed land for her home. They discussed how they could provide that need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the deep bottom of the water, and so they agreed to go find some. Loon dove first, but the distance was too far, and after a long while he surfaced with nothing to show for his efforts. And one by one, the other animals offered to help, otter, beaver, sturgeon, but the depth, the darkness, and the pressures were too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned gasping for air with their heads ringing, and some did not return at all. Soon, only little muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downward, and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, feeling the worst for their relative, fearing the worst for their relative. And before long, a stream of bubbles rolls, rose up with the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless human. Then the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched, and when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Turtle said, here, put it on my back, and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animals, she sang in thanksgiving, and then she began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. The land grew and grew as she danced her gratitude from the dab of mud on Turtle's back until the whole earth was made. Not by Sky Woman alone, but from the alchemy of all the animal's gifts coupled with her deep gratitude. Together they formed what we know today as Turtle Island, our home the earth. And like any good guest, Sky Woman had not come empty-handed. The bundle was still clutched in her hand. When she toppled from the hole in Sky World, she had reached out to grab onto the tree of life that grew there. 
And in her grasp were branches, fruits, and seeds of all kinds of plants. And these she scattered on the new ground, and she carefully tended each one until the world turned from brown mud to lush green. Sunlight streamed through the hole from the sky world, allowing the seeds to flourish. Wild grasses, flowers, trees, and medicines spread everywhere. And now that the animals, too, had plenty to eat, many of them came to live with her on Turtle Island. When we connect with our own cosmology, our stories of creation, we connect with creation itself. We consider our interdependent web of existence of which we are a part, merely a part, We remember what it means to be interdependent. This creation story from the oral tradition of the Great Lakes people and the Iroquois indigenous people, written down by Robin Wall Kimmerer in her seminal text, Braiding Sweetgrass, appeals to me because if we descend from that original sky woman, well, I believe and Robin Wall Kimmerer believes in many ways, we are still falling and still seeking a soft landing upon the earth. To belong to the interdependent web of life is to feel accountable, to experience a sense of true cost and reconciliation with what we have reaped, with the gifts given to us. And I know at this moment, many of us exist in a state of eco-anxiety or climate panic, and it's understandable. And in our panic, we struggle. We struggle with small decisions. We struggle with huge decisions. We struggle to recycle correctly, to make ethical choices about the meat we consume or the fossil fuels we use to take our kids to school. But I want to say that in religious community, there is joy in the communal inspiration to live lightly on the earth. I mean, the thing is about living in America in 2023 is that if we see each other, if we, if we just see our neighbors, those who we admire and just the, those who are in front of us, if we see them consume more and more, always buying larger and larger houses and more and more land for ourselves, flying around the world without a second thought on the resources we might be using, well, then we might find that kind of life enviable. We might find that kind of life attractive. And inspired. Yeah, it's better to have more. It's better to take more and have more for myself. But if, if we see one another turn our lawns into pollinator gardens, save up for electric vehicles, taking carpools to church. By the way, I find that like one of the most inspiring things that I have witnessed lately is when we know we are going to have a really busy day at church, people carpool. And it's wonderful. If we see each other eating and traveling with less impact, if we see each other invest in rainwater harvesting, solar panels, well then we will find that kind of life enviable, attractive, inspired. So, one of our holy aspirations grounded in our UU commitments and one of our core values is to be better stewards of the earth, always. To always honor the interdependence that is at the truth of survival. To honor the kinship with all creation. Viewing ourselves not as consumers, recipients, but as co-creators of an earth that can sustain and thrive for all. I mean, that is just central to what it is to be a Unitarian Universalist. But the, decision, so the, but the decision to undertake this holy work, this sacred vow, really, is up to you. It's your decision. But how we do the work, how we do it matters more than anything. I mean, will we try to control each other? Will we try to shame each other? Or will we take a page from that origin story and invite each other into the dance 
with creation, a dance that can draw someone in. It matters how we invite each other to join into the work of honoring interdependence. And in our story we heard earlier about the 300-year-old growth tree and the entire ecosystem that tree supports, you can see and you can hear how humanity might disrupt that process at every single juncture. But without human interference, the tree's ecosystem thrives and flourishes. See, I didn't want to hear a story about humans today. I just wanted to see, have the experience of nature thriving without that interference and find out what that does to us. And in our Iroquois, Iroquois creation story, Sky Woman falling to the earth, the first human to earth is really viewed as an immigrant, a guest, a guest of the animals, the creatures. In the beginning, before there was anything, there was relationship. There was relationship between human and between creatures. And there was a celestial dance in the mud. This dance could continue if we let it. Now, in wildlife conservation, how many of you have heard the concept of rewilding? Okay. Rewilding. I wonder if any of the kids have been learning about rewilding. So the concept of rewilding refers to restoring habitats and creating corridors between preserved lands to allow declining animal populations to rebound, to come on back. Rewilding is like that column of light right, from Sky Woman falling, illuminating a path forward amidst the darkness of climate change. The great mystery, there is this mystery of what will happen next, but there are these columns of light, and rewilding is one. And we must ask ourselves um, if the thing that has kept us safe through the pandemic, staying inside, staying careful, staying cautious and protective and protected, is this path of restraint going to help us thrive and show up to the dance of creation? as we move into a new phase, in a different era. It is time to become re-enchanted with the world, acting from the inside out, to truly connect with both nature and ourselves. To think about rewilding out there and rewilding in here. Rewilding our own lives and our own hearts. And I've been thinking about how to coexist with jaguars. Now, like so many things, the process of coexisting with jaguars is challenging, like in the sense that it is effortful, in the sense that it takes work, it requires work, but it is also very simple. Someone on the farmland near a jaguar must be always thinking about how to coexist with jaguars. That's it. I mean, there's more to the work of doing that, but someone who is raising livestock, who is a farmer, who is near, who is on, in the civilized world, they need to be thinking about how to coexist with jaguars. So if a livestock animal is sick or dying or dead, it must not languish. The night corrals must have special protection with electric fencing. I mean, this is all how to protect the livestock from jaguars. The livestock must remain in the fields with barriers to the forest because the jaguar's natural habitat is the forests. We must keep waterways separate. Livestock waterway, jaguar waterway over here. But if these things are all maintained consistently, then jaguars will not become a threat to livestock. They will not become a threat to humans either. They will stay in their territory. Now these things are effortful but they are also very possible if the farmer is dancing with the nearby jaguar. If the farmer only wishes to eradicate the jaguar, to preemptively protect their own property, well then that is where the effort will be placed and we will never know the North American jaguar. I mean, did you forget about the North American jaguar? Your ancestors knew it. They knew the truth. 
that jaguars are native to the United States. Jaguars. I mean, I don't know if you knew this. And they may be returning, my friends. Since 2015, three jaguars have been witnessed and documented in the United States. It's not very many, it's just three, but it may be enough. Because we forgot that jaguars were supposed to be here, here. And I wonder what else our wild hearts have forgotten. I mean, we need wild places in the world to exist without the human gaze at all, without any influence of humanity at all. And simultaneously, we need wild places in our hearts and in our lives without curfews, without the responsibility of our commitments hanging over us every minute of our lives. We need to remember to dance with our own wildness, the way humanity has encountered its wildness for millennia, dancing around campfires, daring to let loose a little bit. It was that moment when I walked into um, the Great Hall at the mountain last weekend at 10.30, just as everybody was packing up their instruments, and I said, really? We're already done? And then a few of us hardy, wild souls decided to stay up a little bit later, a few hours later, and sing, just because this was a, the time we had. And we were groggy the next morning, but we had a great time. We let loose a little bit. We got wild, and our wildness is a sacred source of creativity, of innovation, of passion. And it reminds us that not every parcel of land has to have its clear purpose to us. And not every minute of your day must have a purpose. We need some places on the earth to be untamed. Rewilding is simply putting our effort towards the hope that wildness contains. So what would happen if you embraced wildness? If you let, allowed your lawn to become an overgrown pollinator meadow of high grasses and scattered seeds? See what happens, see what comes when you encounter a small piece of wildland. Perhaps it will seep into your psyche. Perhaps it will give you a jolt of something a little more free and easy. And I want to invite you to find something in your own life that you can let go of a little bit. Let go of a little bit of control, something you've been holding tightly, keeping tight control over it so as to make it more manageable. Perhaps it's a schedule. Perhaps it's an attempt to control others' behavior. But there is something in your life that is inviting you not to have dominion over it, but inviting you into a dance with it and see what is created Imagine yourself spinning out just a little bit, releasing some of that tight control, loosening your grip, scattering the seed, and letting go. See how that feels. Follow that freedom. If it feels liberating, then follow the thread further and see if there's something else in your life that needs more space, something in your heart that needs rewilding. The wild hair. The wild invitation, hey, why don't you come to this, this thing? I don't know. I don't know what that's going to be. Maybe say yes. Rewilding is our column of light in the darkness. It is just one of our sources of hope in an anxious world. I mean, we are still falling like the sky woman, and we don't know exactly what the future holds. We still don't know. And so, because we don't know, because we are still living into mystery, we have to ask ourselves this question that is grounded in faith and grounded in creation. Beloveds, what if it all turns out okay? I mean, what happens to your body when you really consider that question? When you face that question. It's a wild question to consider, especially when you know all the facts, but there are also all the mysteries, all that we don't yet know. What if it all turns out okay?